Okay, I think we can start. So my name is Konrad Kaminski. I work for Allegro. Um, and today we're going to learn how we can write asynchronous applications with coroutines and with reactive programming. We're actually going to compare both um, solutions and uh, see what are the advantages and disadvantages of both of them. Um, so we've been doing asynchronous programming with, React with libraries for a couple of years now, and recently a new feature um, in Kotlin has been introduced, namely the coroutines. I mean, the, the feature itself, the coroutines themselves, is an old concept, but in Kotlin it's been around for like two years or so. And, um, and you can use it, obviously, to, to create asynchronous applications. They were actually designed for, for exactly that situation. Um, so it would be worth to know when should we use um, coroutines and when should we use reactive programming, or maybe we can mix both of them. Um, so this presentation, um, I hope, will allow you to see when you should use one or the other. Um, so. For this presentation, I had to choose one of the reactive libraries available because there's like a couple of them, uh, at least the major ones. Um, and I chose Reactor. So Reactor is this, well, it's not quite, it's not that new. It's, it's, I think it's like four, three or four years old. Um, but it's like a backbone of Spring framework. So it's a, quite a modern implementation of um, reactive programming. Um, and it's still being maintained and developed. New features are added. And furthermore, there are some features in Reactor uh, which are not available in other reactive programming libraries, which I want to show you and which, will, um, which we will compare with um, coroutines. So I'm going to actually see a lot of code um, uh, in Kotlin. So um, let's get started. So the first thing that you will um, see immediately if you look at the code written with coroutines and the code written with reactive programming is that uh, with coroutines you write your code just the way you did before, like regular code in your imperative style. Um, like here, for example, we have a, a simple code we just call some functions and prints out some a name of a user. Now, if we want to do the same thing with reactive uh, libraries, then the first thing that you immediately see here is that you have to change it the way you write your code into more functional style. Um, so here you use operators on your reactive types, like map operator or switch of empty operator here, um, and you slice your code into those tiny pieces uh, and you build a pipeline of operations that will be executed. In fact, that's one of the other major differences. With um, reactive libraries, and what you do is first, like, like, there are like two parts. The first part is where you define the pipeline of operations which will happen. So for example, here you have this map operator, switch if empty operator. They both um, are used to define the pipeline of things that will happen. But um, if you call these operators, nothing really happens yet. You just define what will happen. And then you, when you call subscribe, then uh, actually the whole machinery starts um, executing. So th this is like this, this, this two-way, uh, two-step two procedure, whereas with code, you don't have this. You just write your code and it just um, executes. So let's have a look at um, a code, an asynchronous code um, with code and interactive programming in different situations that you encounter uh, in your applications. So let's start with something simple, sequential code. Sequential call meaning that, that you call one asynchronous um, operation, then the other one, then the other one, that the previous ones use the, the values that were returned. Uh, the, the next ones use the values returned by the previous ones, like here, for example. We have a, an asynchronous method called getUser, which returns some data about the user. We, al we also have a function, a regular function, which returns some data about an account. So let's suppose now we want to compose both of these functions. So for a particular user, we want to get the account number of the user. So we, we um, first call getUser, we retrieve the account ID, and then we treat it as an input to the getAccount function. So that's quite straightforward. 
With Rakif programming, we have to do a bit different thing. So with Rakif programming, we have a function, our asynchronous function that returns um, a mano in case of reactor. A mano is this reactive type, uh, which is essentially a stream of zero or one value, or an exception. Um, and the get account uh, is the same as like a regular function. So now if you want to compose them, we have to use a special operator, map. And in fact, this is something that you will see if you, if you um, write code with reactive libraries. You have to use a lot of different operators. You have to learn them uh, in order to do something mean meaningful in your code. Whereas with coroutines, you don't have to actually learn anything new. You write your code the way you did it before. Uh, but here we, we use this map operator, and we have a composition of, of two functions, um, and it works. Now, um, this is fine as long as um, you know beforehand if your functions are synchronous or asynchronous. Because let's suppose that now we want to um, have our get account function to be also asynchronous. So in case of coroutines, we just change the signature. Our function is now a suspending function. It's an asynchronous function. But not, nothing else, we, we don't have to change anything else. Not, not the code of the get account number function stays the same. Now, this is not the case with um, reactive programming, because now if our get account function um, turns into an asynchronous function, um, our code uh, of get account number no longer compiles, because we can't retrieve account number from a mano of, account, of an account. We have to use an operator. So we use an operator, a map operator, like we, um, like we did before. But now the problem is that this code will also not compile, because the code that you see here will return a mano of a mano of a, uh, of a string, and not a mano of a string. Um, so what we have to do is we have to change the map that we originally had to a flat map. That way, our code compiles and behaves the way we want. Well, I'm showing you this because um, this is often what happens if you don't know beforehand if, you, if your code or if your function is synchronous or asynchronous. With coroutines, you usually, if you change it from synchronous to asynchronous, you wouldn't have to change too much in your code, or um, sometimes you don't even have to change anything. With Rakif programming, uh, you have to change all those places where you actually call your function, and then also some other operators, like map to flat map. So, um, uh, so for like long-term projects, this is quite important, um, because you usually don't know beforehand if your function is synchronous or asynchronous. Now, we have asynchronous code, which usually means that we use different threads of execution. So, um, if we process some requests, then part of those processing takes place in one thread, then it takes place in some other thread, etc. So how can we specify what threads um, we want to use for particular operations? Now, with um, coroutines, there is a concept of coroutine context. Coroutine context defines, well, it actually can define many things regarding how coroutine is executed. But one of them is um, there is a special coroutine context called coroutine dispatcher, and it defines what threads are used for um, execution of a coroutine. Um, now, we can create our own coroutine context, coroutine dispatcher. Uh, like here, for example, we use the new fixed thread pool context function, which essentially defines our, um, our coroutine context, which will dispatch execution of your coroutines to some thread pool. And the threads in this thread pool will be named uh, here. It will be, they will be named like user 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And if you want to specify that a particular piece of code should be, or coding should be um, executed in some context, we use the with context um, function, where we pass as a parameter the, the context. Um, now, let's suppose that we have one function which uses one context, and we want to have a different function which uses different context. So we want, for example, uh, before, before we had this function which ret retrieved the username, and now we want to calculate the encryption key based on, the, um, on this username. And let's suppose that this function actually is quite CPU-consuming, because 
um, like the, 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 uh, the encryption function uh, does a lot of things. So we want to limit um, the number of threads that are being used for this particular function so that it, it won't take all of our cores um, in our CPU. So what we can do is we can create a separate code in context, a separate code in dispatcher, and um, also use this with context to specify that this function, this calculate encryption key, should be, should be used different, uh, different threads. And so now we have with context nested inside another with context. And this is perfectly fine, because uh, what will happen is the get username will use its context, the, the context that, that we specified there, and the get user encryption key will use the context that we specified here. So, so it's, it's perfectly uh, normal to use these kinds of constructs. Now, with um, reactive programming, um, the, we, we can also specify what threads can be used. So the equivalent of code in dispatcher in the reactor is a scheduler, and we also cre can create our own schedulers. Um, so here, for example, we create a scheduler which will also have threads uh, with names like user one, two, three, four, five. Um, but to specify what threads should be used, uh, we actually use two different mechanisms. So one is the subscribe on operator. The subscribe on defines where the source or the um, uh, the whatever starts um, the production of the values, uh, like here the get user function, it specifies what threads should be used by this uh, operation. But if you want to specify, if you want to change this, um, uh, this um, uh, thread pool or the scheduler for some other operations, we have to use a different operator, which is called publish on. So, um, so, so uh, like for example here, we have a publish on operator, which means that everything which happens after publish on, like this map um, operator here, will use the encryption um, scheduler. So it's a bit different, um, but conceptually, they both use like thread pools to execute some uh, operations. You just specify them differently. Um, so we have thread pools now. Um, if you use, or probably most of you used um, single-threaded applications. By single-threaded, I mean things, even things like web applications where you process your request in a single thread. Then uh, there is um, a very nice feature in, in the JVM, which is called thread local variables. So basically, you can attach a, a, variable, a variable to a thread. So that, for example, if you process a request in one thread, then let's say you can assign, um, you can put into that variable the request ID or the username or whatever you want. And you can later on retrieve it anywhere in your code because this is attached to your thread. So you, ha you don't have to pass it as a parameter of your of all functions, you know, down all the stack. Now here we use different threads of execution. So the question is, can we somehow have this kind of um, functionality? And the answer is of course, yes. So with coroutines, um, we can create a special coroutine context which is associated with the thread local variable. So here, for example, we have the request ID uh, thread local. And what we want to do is we, uh, we want to store the request ID in that variable and later on retrieve it to put it into some log output, for example. So what you, what you actually uh, can do is we can use a special code in context, which is created with the as context element function. This is the extension function on a thread local. Now, Kotlin allows you to do uh, to create your own functions on existing types, and this is exactly such a function. Uh, and now, what happens is whatever is inside this with context will have access to the request ID thread local, so that whenever Whenever a coding changes a thread of execution inside this with context, then before the coding gets executed, uh, this thread local will be set to the value that was set at the time you called this with context. So you call get user name. At this point, the value of the request ID is read and it's preserved in the coding context that is passed along the execution of this coding in whatever thread. 
uh, this code and gets executed. So this is essentially something like a read-only thread local. You could, you could, th you could think uh, uh, about it in that, in that way. Um, so it's not like fully the same thing as, as thread local, but mostly you usually set the value of the thread local once and then only retrieve it later. So this is, this is quite handy. Now a similar thing is actually uh, also possible with Reactor, and this is one of the reasons I chose Reactor, because uh, I don't know of any other reactive library which has this kind of functionality, which has sort of a context which, um, which you can use in your operations, in your, in your, your pipeline of operations. <coughs> So with Reactor, what you do is um, we also have this request ID thread local variable, um, and we obviously would like to do the same thing as with um, as with coatings. But with Reactor, things work in a bit different way. So what we have is something we just call subscriber context. So in our operations, we can retrieve the subscriber context, and this is sort of like a key value um, store, uh, like a like a map or a dictionary. Um, and uh, we actually set it at the beginning, at the at the time we subscribe to the whole pipeline, and later on in our operations, in our um, functions, we can retrieve it via the subscriber context static um, method. Like here, for example, uh, we use the subscriber context, and then we retrieve the value of the request ID from that context. So to set this um, this uh, to set up this context. We use subscriber context operator. Now, this is a different thing than the subscriber context static method we see um, uh, before. Uh, so, subscriber context operator defines uh, the, the values that will be passed to all your operations um, downstream. So, we set it up on a call to get user name, and then we can later retrieve it in our, in our operations. So, the concept is very similar. Uh, the, the bad thing is that you don't really have the same, um, you, you can't use thread locals, um, but you have to use special API for, um, for retrieving these values. So, um, so it's a bit better with, with coroutines. Now, uh, so far we talked about, um, we only talked about um, like happy path scenarios, but uh, you know, things uh, usually are not always um, happy. Uh, so we have to also take care of scenarios where we have exceptions. Um, so let's see how it is, how, how we can handle them. So with coroutines, we actually don't have to do anything special. I mean, we can write regular code um, with our asynchronous function. Uh, so we use try catch as we did before. Uh, now with uh, with Project Reactor, we have to use one of the operators, obviously. And there's like a couple of them. So for example, we can use the on error return operator, which will provide, which, uh, where you provide a default value, which will be returned when there is an exception in your pipeline of operations. Uh, there are some other operators also, which allow you to more dynamically produce those, those values. But still, you have to learn all those operators, and you have to use this functional style um, to uh, uh, for, your, for your code. Um, so if we have exceptions, then sometimes what we want to do is we want to retry. Because let's suppose that, well, if, if there is asynchronous programming, then usually there is some I.O. involved. So for example, we go over a network to fetch some data from some database server or some microservice or whatever. So essentially, we send a request, and then we, we wait for a response, and we may get this response, or we may, we may not get it, or we may get some incorrect response. Um, and sometimes the network fails, and we want to retry, for example, a couple of times before, before giving up. So um, the question is, how can we do it with both of these solutions? Um, again, with, uh, with coroutines, that's, we, we use uh, regular code. So here, for example, you can, you, we have a, a loop, uh, where we try calling a function several times, and we wait between the the um, uh, the subsequent calls. Um, like so, first here we have first wait for half a second, then for a second, etc., up to five times, uh, and then only then if if our function uh, throws an exception, then we just um, give up. Um, 
And in, in fact, um, this kind of code is so um, uh, it's so common. I mean, if we want to retry an operation, probably there are some, upper, some other operations that you want to retry, so we usually extract this um, retrying code into some higher order function. So we can do the same thing here with Kotlin, where <coughs> we can define the retry function, which takes as a parameter a function and some parameters about the retrial policy, um, so that all this logic about retrying is, is separated. And, and now our code looks a bit better, a bit simpler. Uh, so it's, uh, it's easier to use. Um, now, now with uh, Reactor, it's a bit more difficult. So the, the, obviously the, the, the creators of Reactor have thought about um, retrials also. And they provide a special operator called uh, retry when. So we try when takes as a parameter a function which itself takes as a parameter which takes as a parameter a flux of throwables and returns a flux of longs. So flux is a stream of possibly infinite stream of values. And there, there's a timing factor. So it's like a sequence, like a list, but there's a timing factor attached to it so that um, the values will be delivered uh, on some specific time. And by using this, we can actually say when and if we want to retry. So um, the, the function that we've seen before, the policy that we've seen before with coroutines, uh, it can be um, also uh, provided, as you can see uh, on this slide, um, also for, for, um, for product reactor. It's a bit more complex, but essentially what it does is it takes an incoming flux um, of uh, throwables, so the exceptions which are thrown um, in your operations, and then based on whether uh, uh, on how many how many times we tried, it delays. So this mono delay that you that you see um, uh, is actually what what uh, uh, it actually delays for some time, uh, and essentially it's the same policy. So it waits for like half a second, a second, etc. Uh, and then it produces a value to the output flux, which is an indication that, okay, we want to retry now. It's somewhat convoluted. It's not as simple as with coroutines. Um, fortunately, for uh, many kinds of uh, retrial policies, there are some libraries available which you can download and use, which have those common policies implemented as functions so that um, you don't have to do it yourself. Um, but if you want to, to create your own kind of policy, then you have to write this kind of code. So, so in this case, I would, I would say um, coroutines are a bit, bit better um, in, in terms of how you write your code and how easy it is to write your code. So, so far we talked about only about um, sequential code, but since we have asynchronous functions, then we might want to execute a couple of them concurrently. So let's see how we can write concurrent code with coroutines and, reactor and with Reactor. So there is a special function called async, which, um, which allows you to asynchronously um, create and execute a coroutine. Um, so let's suppose that we have two, fun two asynchronous functions, get user and get roles. So the first one retrieves some data about the user, the, 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 the second one retrieves the roles of that user. And we want to call those functions concurrently because, for example, they access different microservices running on different servers. And then we want to combine the result of both of these functions. Um, so how do, we, how do we do it with coroutines? Well, we use async to call both of these functions. Async will start um, executing the coroutines which are passed as a parameter of async. Um, and then the the async itself will finish its execution and it will, it will return uh, something which is called deferred, an object of, of the type deferred. Deferred, you can think of deferred as of a promise type object. So things like completable future in Java are very similar. Uh, the difference is that with completable future, if you want to extract a value, uh, I think there's a method called get. Uh, this method is blocking 
So your thread will block until you, this value is delivered to this completable future. With deferred, um, the, the, the function um, is called await, which retrieves the value from this deferred. It's a suspending function, so it means that the thread will not be blocked, because in coroutines, threads do not block on suspending functions. They, they only suspend um, the functions. So in, in, in this code, we, um, we um, start executing both coroutines. They go to some microservice, fetch some data, and later on we will await for the, for the results um, of both of them and combine them and return. So that's quite straightforward. Um, one nice feature of... Um, uh, oh, there, there's one more thing here, the code in scope. So code in scope, it actually defines you... Um, well, a scope of operations. So basically what happens is whatever coroutines you create inside this coroutine scope, they have to finish its execution before the coroutine scope uh, is sort of, you could say it's closed, so it retains a, a value. So uh, what, it, uh, what it means um, in practice is that um, let's suppose uh, that these functions that we have here, get user and get roles, work this way. The get roles function, well, the get user function, uh, it takes quite a long time to execute, like a minute. And then it returns some value. But the get roles function, it fails quickly with an exception. So what, what, we, would, uh, what we would like to have is that the get user with roles function should also fail quickly, because get roles fails. But we call await on the roles as a second call. So the, the first call is a wait on the user. So normally we would have to wait for a minute, get some data about the user, and then we call a wait on the roles only to learn that the, 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 the roles, uh, the get roles function failed, which is not nice. But since we have this coroutine scope, the coroutine scope knows about all the coroutines that were created inside this scope. And the way it works is that if any of this coroutine fails, then all of the other coroutines are cancelled, and they return also the, a, a failure um, result. So in our case, it means that if the get, get roles fails with an exception, then even though we call await on the, on the user, uh, th this await will also throw an exception immediately, uh, right after get roles um, returns an exception. So this is a very nice, a very nice uh, behavior. And in fact, we have the same kind of behavior with Reactor. Um, the, the code is a bit, uh, a bit different because now we have two functions, which we have within mono, and we have to combine those monos to create a, an, another mono. And we do it with the zip width um, operator. And zip width takes uh, a pair of uh, monos and, uh, and a function, and this function gets executed once those monos uh, there are some values delivered to those monos, um, and this function gets executed on the result of, of those functions. So um, the code here, um, it looks a bit better, I think, with Reactor than with coroutines. The code with coroutines is a bit uh, more convoluted. Uh, so I actually, I'm, I thought about some other uh, situation where uh, not so simple situation where things would be different. So um, one of those situations is cancellations. So sometimes you want to cancel an operation because you don't really care about the result. So before I talked about sort of automatic cancellation because one of the coatings fails, but it's not always the case. You, you sometimes want to cancel an operation even though um, nothing failed. So for example, let's suppose that uh, uh, we have this example with user and roles. And a user can be blocked. And if a user is blocked, we don't really care about roles. Um, so what we want to do is, if we get the information about the user, and that user is blocked, then we want to cancel the execution of the, opera of the operation which retrieves roles, and we just return the empty roles. So with coroutines, it's quite straightforward. We, get, we wait for the user. If, it's, if the user is blocked, we cancel the coroutine which, um, which retains roles and returns some value. Otherwise, we proceed as before. Now, uh, we can do the same thing with Reactor, obviously, but the code is a bit more difficult. In fact, I don't even know if that code is uh, as uh, correct, 
I asked a few friends to, uh, to tell me what, how would they write it, and they're actually quite, quite fluent in those reactive libraries. So they came up with some solutions. I took them and put something uh, uh, for myself, and this is what, what I have. Uh, I would be happy to, to see if, uh, if there is some simpler code, but just we will not analyze that, of course, but um, just by looking at it, you can see that it's a lot more difficult than the code with coroutines. So essentially, with this kind of um, uh, with this, this kind of situation, uh, you would probably um, use coroutines. Now we talked about concurrent code. Now let's talk about parallel code. So by parallel code, I mean that you want to execute one function, one asynchronous function for a number of uh, different values of parameters. So for example, we have a get user. Still, we have a get user function, and we want to uh, retrieve. Uh, the, the value of, get, of user for different users for one account. So we have a get user IDs function, which retrieves a list of user IDs, and we have a get user function, which returns a user, and we want to combine them. So again, with coroutines, that's quite straightforward. Um, in a coroutine scope, first we call one function to retrieve the, user, the list of user IDs, um, then we create a coroutine for every user ID, which retrieves a user, and then we use a, an await all function, which just awaits for all of those lists of the deferred that's, the, that's returned, and retrieves the values from those deferred. Now, with, um, with um, Reactor, it's a bit different, because uh, if we have functions which return a mano of a user or a mano of a list, then we have to first transform a mano of a list to a flux, and then uh, when we have a flux, uh, transform it back to a mono of a list. So it's kind of, um, again, convoluted. What we normally would do is we would directly use a flux, and then our code would look a bit better, actually a lot better, than the one with um, coroutines. So um, I mentioned flux. So flux is this possibly infinite stream of values. Um, now, uh, there is a, con a, a similar concept in, um, in coroutines to um, flux, which is called channels. So a channel in the coroutines is something, you can think of it as a FIFO queue, where you can send a value to this queue and you can retrieve a value from that queue. But the functions which send a value and retrieve a value, they are suspending functions. So they, do, they do not block the thread. Um, uh, and how, how do you actually use um, channels. Um, there is actually a receive channel and a send channel. They, they are used for receiving and sending. There's also a channel, simply, which, with, which is both receiving and, and sending channel. Um, so let's suppose you want to have a function which returns a, a list of users, and we want to print the names of those users. Um, so we can create a simple loop, which just receives values and prints out the name of these um, uh, names. Uh, but the, the problem with this kind of code is that a channel can be closed. If a channel is closed and you, want, and you try to receive a value, you will get an exception. So that's not, not really nice behavior. Um, what we can use is uh, a receive or null function, uh, which will return a null value uh, when the channel is closed. Um, so uh, that's one way to do it. The other way is to use a built-in function called consume each, where your, um, the parameter of this consume each is a function which will be called for every value which, is in the, which will, will be delivered to this, this um, channel. So this is how you, how you uh, work with channels um, in coroutines. For reactive programming, uh, we use flux, and there is uh, a number of ways we can get and, and work on the values delivered by flux. One of them is simply called subscribe, where you pass a, a function which will just take care of all those uh, values delivered in this flux. Uh, so that's very similar. Now, how do we generate these kinds of streams? So with channels, um, it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite simple. We just create a channel, uh, like here we create a channel of users, and then what we do is we launch a coroutine, we just sends values to these channels. So here we launch a query and we use send function to send some one value, second value, and then we close the channel. So that, that's all we, uh, we do. Um, 
in fact, this is such a very common uh, pattern that there is a special function called produce, which will actually create a channel um, and it will be a receiver type of this function that is passed as a parameter of produce so that you can just write produce and then use the functions like send and close. Um, with uh, with um, Project Reactor, that's also quite simple. Um, we actually, there's a number of ways to generate fluxes. Here it's a, a very simple one. We use the generate function when, uh, where we have the sync to sync uh, object on which we call some, some functions like next or complete to also emit values or, or close that flux. So it's very, si it's very, very similar. Now, um, th there's like a list of operators, a lot of operators actually on the, um, on the reactive types. Um, and uh, you can also write uh, your own uh, operators, although that's quite uh, difficult. But uh, with coroutines, you also have these kinds of operators. Uh, for example, here you, can, you, you see a simple code with operators like filter not or map. Um, so th it's very similar to the code uh, which, we, which is uh, with um, uh, reactor, where you also have operators like filter not or map. But the, the difference is that whereas in the flux, you actually, the filter not and the map are operators, so nothing really happens before you subscribe to this flux. Um, in coroutines with channels, um, when, you, uh, when you invoke filter not, there will be a coroutine uh, started, and th this coroutine will, wa will wait for some values from the, uh, from, the input from the input channel, and it will send, or not send in case of filter not, values to the output channel. So um, th there is a bit of difference in, how, in the way they work um, uh, internally. Um, I mentioned custom operators. Now, I will not show you an operator, a custom operator for uh, Project Reactor. Uh, I actually only took a look at the existing ones. And for example, the, um, the code for the filter operator it takes about 300 lines of code. Uh, uh, it's really very long and, and, and quite complex. Uh, whereas with code, that's quite uh, simple. It's quite simple to write your own um, operator. Like here, for example, you have a code for the filter map operator, which acts as a filter and map in, 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 one, um, in one shot, um, where you just filter value uh, by some predicate, and, um, and if, it, if it fits that predicate, then it, the value is sent. Uh, so so the, writing these kinds of operators, it's, it's really quite um, simple. Uh, now, there is something called back pressure. So essentially, if you have a producer of values and you send a lot of values and you have a consumer of those values and the consumer is slow, so it, that it, it's, it's, um, it's not processing those values um, as fast as it, as it, as it should, then um, it may happen that, that the consumer is overwhelmed with these, um, uh, with these um, values. So there are some policies about what to do with it. So um, there is a couple of uh, ways to specify what should happen with, um, with coroutines and with reactor. Now, by default, um, the way channels work in coroutines is that when you send the value to a channel and there is no one on the receiving side, then your send function will be suspended. You will not be able to send a different, actually you will not be able to do anything in that coroutine because send will be suspended. And the same applies for the receiving side. If you try to receive something from a channel and there is nothing in that channel, but the channel is not closed, but there is nothing in that channel, um, your coroutine will be suspended until, until there is something in that channel. So th there is sort of like a natural back pressure. You will not be able to send too many values. You have to wait for the, those values to be processed before you can send the next ones. But sometimes it's not, it's not something that you want. So uh, the default uh, behavior, um, uh, which uh, is um, the default behavior of the channel um, is uh, called rendezvous. So we have a rendezvous channel, which means that the receiving and sending site w should, should meet. Uh, but you can also create a different one, uh, different ki kinds of channels. For example, you can have a buffer channels. So you put a buffer between the sender and the receiver. 
For example, here you have a buffer of the size five. So it means you will be able to send up to five values, and even though there is no one on the receiving side, the send will not be suspended. Only when you call the sixth time, it will be suspended. Um, you can have an unlimited buffer, which essentially means the send will never be suspended. But the problem is um, there is only like uh, limited num a limited amount of memory that you have, and these um, values are kept in memory. So we can, you can, um, uh, you can uh, uh, receive uh, a, a, an exception saying that you're out of memory. So that's quite dangerous. Um, and there is also a channel called conflated. So conflated means that the receiving side will only see the last value that was sent and not processed. So imagine you have a, a sensor of a temperature and it sends values constantly, like very often. And there is a receiving side which reads those values, but it reads those values as like once a second. So it means that, that uh, when the sensor sends a value, the receiving side reads that value and does, does something with it. And the sensor sends more values, but these values are ignored. Only the last value is actually remembered, you could say, so um, in, in a channel. And when the receiving side uh, asks for, uh, for another, for, for the next value, it will actually receive this last value that was sent by the sensor. So this, is, this is also something which is sometimes useful. And of course, for um, reactor, uh, you have the same kinds of policies uh, that you can specify. Uh, you, you can also specify that there is a buffer. You can specify something which is similar to the conflated um, channel. And, uh, you can also create your own um, policies. So we've seen that um, in some situations, coatings are better. In some situations, reactor is better. Now the question is, can you somehow use one and or the other um, solution and combine both of them? And the answer is yes. So there are some interoperability um, functions which you can use to combine both of these solutions. So for example, um, if you have a function which retains a, a reactive type, uh, so it retains, for example, a mano of a user, um, and we want to use it in our coroutine, then we can use one of the extension functions defined on this reactive type. Uh, so, for example, there is an await first or null function, which will wait for, uh, for the value which will deliver to the mono, and the, or if, the, if there is no, no value, it will return a, a, a null value. And there's like a couple of those, um, uh, of those kinds of extension functions. And, the same, um, and by the same token, you can do um, the conversion the other way around. So if you have a suspending function, um, which returns um, a user, and you want to create a function which returns a mono because you have a library which expects uh, reactive types. Then you can use a mono function where you just um, uh, specify as a parameter your, your, um, your coroutine, um, and this mono function retains a mono as a result. So you can combine, uh, combine uh, your library which expects reactive types with coroutines. And the same thing applies to flux and channels. You have ways to convert flux to channel and the other way, um, and the other way around. Now, um, channels are actually, um, if, you've, if you've done something with reactive programming, there is a concept of, um, of a hot stream and a cold stream. So a, a hot stream is something um, uh, that emits values even though there is no subscriber, there is no one listening. The cold stream is something which actually starts working only when you subscribe to it. Um, so uh, if you look at um, channels, they are actually hot streams because um, the way we create channels is we launch a code in which it does something uh, and sends some values to a channel. So it is sending values, it usually suspends after a while, because there is no one listening, for example. Uh, but, uh, but essentially, it's a, an example of a hot stream. Uh, and up until about two months ago, there was really no cold stream equivalent uh, in coroutines. But about two months ago, uh, initial design was started for something called flow. Uh, 
So Flow, it's actually it supports both hot streams and cold streams um, because uh, on, on the, you can't really tell if it's a hot stream or a cold stream, but by convention, it should be used as a cold stream only. Now, this is only the initial design. There's, there's like some preliminary, preliminary, preliminary version available. Um, so the API may change. Um, so uh, uh, I will just show you this one slide where you can see how the Flow API looks like. It's actually quite simple. The Flow itself has one, um, one um, function called collect. Uh, so it's something similar to subscribe for Flux. Um, and this collect uh, accepts as a parameter an interface flow collector which emits a value. So, for example, if you want to write a function which returns users uh, as a flow of users, you can use the flow function and the emit functions um, to emit the values of the, the, the users themselves. Um, and the print users uh, function is also, also quite simple where you use the collect function. Now, there are some additional functions which are not presented here. So for all those operators which are available on the, on the flux, um, or essentially the reactive types, the, the, there are also operations on the flow uh, type. They actually added in, in new versions of the Kotlin um, code in the library. Uh, and as I said, this is quite fresh. Uh, so th it can probably change, and it, it will probably change. Um, but uh, but th this is something which was missing from coroutines because there were no cold streams. Now we will have also co uh, cold streams, so we will have like sort of like a full equivalent of what we have in reactive um, programming. So to to summarize uh, 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 all of it, um, should we use coroutines or should we use reactive programming? So. Essentially, it, it actually depends on your, your use case. So if you have sequential code, probably coroutines is, is a better solution because they were actually designed for sequential code. Um, for, for concurrent code, it actually <coughs> depends on the complexity of, of, your, um, of what you want to um, achieve. Sometimes it's better to use reactive programming. Sometimes it's better to use coroutines. Channels, they actually, this is something I haven't said, it's, they are experimental, but they've been experimental for I don't know, a year and a half or so, and the API doesn't really change that much. So you can think of them as pretty stable. They will probably be stable once the flow um, design will be finished, so that everything, because there is some interoperability between the flow and channel. Um, but as I said, the, the, the API of channels haven't, haven't actually changed much for, for the past um, a year and a half or so. So, so it, 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 you can think of them as pretty stable. And uh, you can always mix both solutions and um, choose uh, the better one for, for, uh, for your case. So if you, <coughs> sorry, if you want to find more information, there are two uh, good sources. One is a document uh, which is called a guide to reactive streams with coroutines, which essentially focuses on um, on the differences and um, interoperability between um, reactive programming and coroutines. Um, and the other one is the coroutine guide. Uh, it's like a general guide to coroutines, and it also contains some um, useful information. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, if there are any questions, I think I have one minute left, and uh, I, you can also find me after the talk. Uh, I'll be around. <laughs>